The Bible reminds us to seek first the kingdom of God. Amen? And uh, that's a great song and a wonderful prayer. I hope that's your prayer on your heart today, is that you're seeking Christ first. You're demonstrating that. You're moving in the right direction by being here this morning, the first day of the week. We've come together remembering Christ was risen on the first day, and we remember that. Our hope and victory is found in the fact that our Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, not only paid for our sin, but He rose from the grave, uh, conquering death and conquering hell and giving us the victory through Him. And so we, we celebrate that today. We worship Him today. And I'm glad to see each of you today. Uh, before we get into our um, morning message, I want to encourage you uh, to come back this evening. Now, if you've got children, they will drag you back because we launch Awana again tonight, and our kids are just ecstatic about Awana getting started. They can't wait, and, uh, and so uh, they're, they're ready to go. Down in the gym, you can drop them off. Um, and, uh, but parents, don't drop them off and leave. Come. We're in the middle, or just starting, our, uh, our Sunday night series, Fight the Good Fight, and uh, the bookmarks were out there on the, the Welcome Center, and we are talking on Sunday night about various individuals who are part of the Reformation. And this is the 500th anniversary of uh, the beginning of the Reformation. And uh, we find that there's some wonderful individuals uh, and stories about individuals that God used in that time that are very relevant to how we live today. And it, our goal is to not just give straight history lesson. It's, it's, it's certainly to look at the individuals from uh, the Reformation, but also preach a message from God's Word that helps us to live out those lessons in our own lives. And a wonderful, wonderful uh, time last Sunday as we studied Augustine and heard about his conversion and how God used him. And he wasn't a reformer. He was a, re a man that many of the reformers looked to um, and uh, was very encouraged. Tonight, William Tyndale. So I want to encourage you, come tonight, hear about uh, William Tyndale and how God used him and how it can be used in our own lives today. <clears throat> have you ever um, been out driving around and you didn't know where you were going? I mean, you knew where you wanted to go, but you didn't know how to get there. And there came a point in time where you had to either say to yourself or say to someone else, preferably a local who knew where the you know where the the destination was you had to say to them like where is the you know the, the place I'm headed and and how do I get there right how many have ever had to ask that question where is something and how do I get there you've asked that question at some point in your life all, right, all the ladies raise their hand not all the men raise their hand, and it's not because the men instinctively know where everything is. It's because maybe uh, they, they weren't ribbed hard enough by their wife, who reminded them about that time where they should have stopped and asked, where is it, and how can we get there? You know, I think the reality is all of us in life, at one point or another, have to, have to say, you know, I don't know where I'm going. Now, I know where I need to be going, but I just don't know how to get there. And when it comes to the spiritual journey that we are on, I think most of us would say, I know I'm supposed to be more like Jesus. I know that's the destination, but I'm not sure in my life how to do that. I'm not sure how to change to become more like Jesus. I remember many years ago, as a member of AAA, when we would go on vacations, we would call them up ahead of time. And we would say, we are going to, and we'd list the specific hotel in the specific city, and they would prepare for us, if you called them early enough, it, like two weeks ahead of time, they would prepare what was called a triptychs, right? The old timers here remember the triptychs. And the triptychs were turn by turn directions. They would, you'd go pick it up, they'd get it, and you would flip, and it would say, okay, start from your house at this street, go this direction, go so many miles, turn right, go on this. And, and, and I mean, they would just give you every turn by turn by turn. It was wonderful, it was so helpful. 
until you hit your first detour. Wait, wait, the trip tick says I should be going on this road, but the detour says I can't go on this road. What do I do? And you get off and, and uh uh-oh, now I'm not quite sure, you know, where I'm going because because now I'm lost. I I don't have, I might might have had directions for this first part, but it's not all working out or I got off and I'm not on the right road and, and this doesn't help anymore because I don't have the bigger picture. Just had that turn by turn direction. And I think sometimes in our spiritual journey, in our Christian walk of becoming more like Christ, uh, in that pursuit of holiness, we often want the Bible to function like a turn by turn direction. Like we want we want to open up to like a certain book in the Bible, we'll call it first Kevin chapter 1, and it says, okay, Kevin, here's where you're starting. Here's exactly where you're at in your spiritual journey. Now, this is what I want you to do next. And this is what I want you to do right after that. And this is the very next step. And that we want that turn-by-turn guidance so often to help us. And if we had that, if like I had that book in the Bible that was just written for Kevin and his spiritual journey, man, I would know exactly what to do. But I haven't found that book in the Bible. It's, It's not there. Now, I'm not saying the Word of God isn't a guide to us. No, in fact, the Word of God is a lamp unto our feet. It is a guide unto our path. So hang with me. I'm, we're not throwing away the Bible just because it doesn't function like triptychs. No, it functions much better than triptychs in our life. Because it provides the bigger picture for us, for all of our lives, to find our way to Jesus, to, to, to know how to journey through life. But we often want that, that, uh, that turn-by-turn direction. Uh, we want to know, where do I turn? Do I go right or left? Do I stay or leave? Do I engage or disengage? I'm talking spiritual now. We want to know spiritually. Do, do we get involved in this ministry or not? Uh, when will I arrive in Christ-likeness? How many like spiritual miles? How many more journeys? How many more... Uh, stumbles do I have to go through before I get there? What points of interest will I come across in, in my spiritual journey? Um, and when I get there, will dinner be ready? I mean, really, I mean, those are the important questions, right? Well, we're asking those questions. But in the Bible, we're, we're not told all of those things. And so, because we don't have that book in the Bible that gives us that turn-by-turn direction, what oftentimes we do is we want somebody else to give us that instruction. Hey, pastor! Tell me what to do next. As if pastor can give you wisdom that supersedes the direction that the Bible gives you already. Pastor, tell me exactly what I need to do. You're you're my shepherd, so guide me specifically. Tell me, like, because you're wise, or supposed to be, right? Or or if if we don't seek the pastoral um, directive, we seek uh, the biblical version of the fortune teller, right? We put out our fleeces. We um, seek the voice of God through our feelings or our senses, or we want God to speak to us because if the, if the, the clear direction isn't there in the Bible. So God, do I do this or not? And I'm just going to wait here until I get an inkling. And, um, and, and that's really dangerous, guys. It's really dangerous for us to think that that's what God is, is going, how God's going to guide and direct us. Um, so oftentimes, then, if we're looking for that turn-by-turn direction on how to get to Christ's likeness and holiness... Uh, we're often left then to our own abilities to try to understand that. Or once we even have that turn-by-turn direction, we're left with our own ability to obey. Like as if we could actually do it if we knew what to do, apart from God and apart from His Word. What the Bible provides for us is something better than the turn-by-turn direction. Here I have an, an atlas. Um, for you young people, it is actually something that you, you, you look to. It's, a, it's called a map, all right? Um, it's where Google Map got its idea, okay? Um, and I know you don't use these anymore, but uh, when I did have a triptych, I would use a map like this. And it, it's, it's a little bit better because if, uh, if uh, there was a detour, I could find an alternative route, I could look at a map like this, and, and, uh, and let's say that, that there was a bridge that was out. I could find my way to another bridge to cross a river. And so it gave me a much broader perspective uh, to help me on my journey. And, uh, and I know today we have Google Maps, so these are becoming increasingly a relic, aren't they? Right? Um, in fact, somebody gave it to me because they don't need it anymore. And it's sitting in my office, so I grabbed it for my 
my big illustration this morning. But the Bible, listen, the Bible is our guide. The Bible provides us uh, a, a bigger picture, an understanding of where we are and where we are headed and how to get there. And I want us to be encouraged by that as we're thinking through how to change. How to change. Last week we talked about the importance of community in the change process. And this morning I want us to understand the big picture in the process of change. Knowing the big picture will help us in the change process. And I want everybody in our church to know and understand the big view. We might understand it as, as the helicopter view. Like if you're in a big city and you're, you're not quite sure and you're kind of lost, if you get up in a helicopter and look down, you get a bigger perspective. And the Bible gives us that bigger perspective on life. It explains things to us. When, when, you, when you understand the big picture and then you read the Bible, it's going to make sense of the tension that you're facing, the pressure that you're under. It's going to make sense of the redemption that is being offered to you through Christ. It will help you when you, when you sit in your care group this week and you listen to someone tell their story of grace or, or ask for a prayer or, or talk about a circumstance that they're facing and, and how they should respond to it. If you have the big picture, you're going to receive that information and, and with grace and be able to respond to it. Paul Tripp, in his book uh, that he co-authored with Tim Lane, titled How People Change, unpacks four elements um, that we all experience in, in growing and changing. And I want to give those four, and then we'll look in Scripture. So I'm kind of doing it in reverse. I'm giving you four Elements, and then I'm going to show them to you in Scripture this morning. So be patient with me. I'm going to have you open your Bibles. In fact, we're going to go to Jeremiah 17 that was read. It will be one of our first main texts to look at. But I want, I want you to take note of these four elements that are part of the change and growth process that we find explained to us as part of the big picture in the Bible. The first one, the first biblical component that helps us understand or get this big picture is just this word, heat. So write that word down, heat. Right? When I say heat, what I'm talking about is what the people in Florida are experiencing. It's like the pressure of a situation. It's a, a storm in our life. It, it's the, the circumstance that makes up the context of our life. And this morning, everyone in here has circumstances in their life that are producing that that, that tension, that pressure, and that heat. And this week in your life, heat may have been applied to your life in a number of ways. Uh, and, and they could all be very different. Like for, for a husband, maybe uh, in your, for a husband maybe who failed to listen when asked him to pick up the kids at school and the teacher called. There's some heat, right, uh, in the life of the wife as she's like, why didn't he do that? And the pressure she's feeling. Or maybe you're feeling the heat from a wife who went shopping and spent money that wasn't in the budget. And now there's some pressure on the finances and then in the conversations between the husband and wife. Or maybe heat this week in your life from a teenager who is increasingly becoming defiant and isolated from the rest of the family. And as a parent, man, that's creating some tension within you because you're not quite sure what's going on or who's influencing them. Or maybe the owner of the company who expects you to do everything just the way that they want, but they always or often fail to tell you their expectations. And so you want to you wanna please the boss, but they're not clear. And so there's pressure that you face when you go into work. Or maybe mom from a toddler, and the, 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 your child, you love them, and they're just not developing as fast as the charts at the pediatrician's office say that a child should be developing or is supposed to be developing, and you begin to feel pressure. Well, what's going on here? And, and, and what do I need to do? And, 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 and I, I'm not sure why this is, is occurring. Certainly, uh, just from circumstances in our world, like from a hurricane, right, or two that cause disruptions in your day, or as, as some people in our church plan to go to Florida on vacation this week, right? And so there's some disruption, and that just causes some pressure. 
So heat can come from anywhere, heat can come from anyone, and it can come at any time. And we all experience it. We can just say it's the stuff that's going on. And in many times, we're not able, despite our best efforts, to change that pressure, to change that heat, to turn it down or turn it off. Right? So that's just one element that God uses in our life to change and grow us. Let me give you a second element. It's thorns. Thorns. All right, so what happens when the pressure increases and the temperature rises? Well, we aren't passive. We respond to that. We, we, we act. We're responding to the things that occur around us. We're not passive individuals. Now, if the heat is bad and the heat is difficult, the thorns are worse. The thorns are worse because we have, we have to own the thorns because thorns are not something outside of us. Thorns are not the circumstances of, of our life, the context of our life. Thorns are, are from within. Thorns, we could say, is, 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 they're from inside us. They're, they're who we are. It's that sin nature. The thorns are, are the desires that we have that supersede our desire to please God. We want something. We want, uh, we want somebody to like us more than we want to love and serve God. Or we want, we want everything in our marriage and in our family to go perfect, and, and it just doesn't, right? And so those desires that we have, and, and certainly the Bible tells us that desires form our actions and our behavior. And so we have thorns in how, how we act and how we behave and the things that we do, and the words that come out of our mouth when the teenager's not responding and thinking we're the best parent ever. And we just don't always respond well to that, and we're calling that thorns. And the Bible addresses those kind of both desires and behaviors. And what happens when you don't respond well, when you don't act well? Well, there's negative consequences. We can throw that into this thorns category too. And, and here's the thing. We're talking about it. The Bible talks about it. We need to talk about it because we want to become more like Christ. We don't want to respond well. We don't want to have wrong desires. We don't want to have bad actions. And certainly, we don't want those bad fruit in our life that comes when we live out of our sin nature. So the change process has to acknowledge and address this. So when we're getting this big picture, we identify there's just pressures in life, and we don't always respond well to those pressures. So heat and thorns. But here's the good news of the Word of God. The big picture, man, if we stopped here, we'd all leave depressed. Here's the big picture. Here's the good news. It's the cross. All right, so that's the third word. The third element is the cross. And the whole Bible is a Bible, as we learned in our biblical theology series, is pointing us to Jesus Christ. Again, this is big picture stuff, and, and, and we're learning that that as we change and grow, we can't do it apart from the cross of Jesus Christ. And I'm glad this morning that at the intersection of change and growth, we find the cross of Jesus. The cross is shorthand for this. Basically, who God is and what He is at work doing to redeem people. Right? So when we think about the cross, it says something about the character of God and His big purpose to redeem us. And the Bible is a story that lays that open. So as we're reading the Bible and we see about people who are struggling and the things in like a sin-cursed world and there's sin going on and the people themselves are sinning, they need a Savior. They need a Redeemer. We all need a cross. We all need Jesus. There are so many verses that point us to our hope in the cross of Jesus Christ that demonstrate that change is possible. Just a few of those verses Ephesians 4, 1, uh, 1, 4. According to His plan, He's chosen us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy. God planned that we would become like Him. That's God's plan. And He planned that from the beginning. Before there was ever any pressure, before there was ever any heat, before there was ever any thorns, before there was ever any sin, God said, my plan is for people to be like me, to be holy without blame before him in love. He predestined us according to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. He has made us accepted in the beloved. I'm so encouraged <clears throat> that God had a plan to redeem us, to change us, to grow us from the beginning of the world, to be holy, to be a part of his family, to be adopted into his family. Listen, the reason that encourages me is because nothing's going to thwart God's plan. Those pressures that you face this week, 
man, those tensions that you're going through, the circumstances of life that you can't do anything about, they don't touch God's plan. God's plan is going forward. God's plan is in motion. I'm encouraged about that. I'm encouraged that when we, when we are called to help people grow and change in our care group, in our life, and in our church, that we can encourage them and say, God is at work. I know you've come tonight and, and Wednesday or Monday or Thursday, whenever you're meeting this week in, in your care group, and you're saying, man, this is what's going on in my life. We say, hey, you know what? Thanks for sharing that. That's real. The Bible addresses what's going on in the context of our life. But I just want to be reminded that we also were going to be, bring the cross to bear. For, for who is God in the midst of that? What is Christ doing to change us in the midst of that? There's always hope. There's always hope. And I hope that because change takes place in community, that when you gather together, that one or two or three or more of you are always finding a way to bring the discussion of the cross into the context of the trial and into the context of the problem. I appreciate the Apostle Paul, who was a missionary, who went around um, preaching, starting churches, and, and he said, listen, for me, it's all about the cross. It's all about the cross. I'm going to preach Jesus, he said. But specifically to the Corinthian church in his... In, um, in his first, um, in First Corinthians, in chapter two, there's this challenge of: Are we going to, are we going to, are we going to try to find solutions for life from man's wisdom, right? From philosophy? Or are we going to find solutions for life from from the cross of Jesus Christ? Where does our hope lie? And Paul said, "Man, for me, it's always the cross." He said, "I didn't even come to baptize, but to preach the gospel." not with words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Right? Paul's not saying, listen, if you just listen to me, I'm an apostle, I'm going to tell you what to do. I'll, I'll be your personal triptychs. No, he says, I'm going to point your salvation. It's, it comes from Jesus. It's in Jesus. Right? So we're going, to, we're going to preach the cross. And so there's this debate and discussion about who's wise and what's really going to work. And, and his conclusion, for after that the wisdom of God the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And just a few verses later, but unto them which are called, both Jew and Greek, it's Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The big picture view that the Bible shows us on how to become holy intersects with the work of Jesus Christ and the person of God. And any solution that removes Christ or diminishes Christ is not a solution. It's an alternative, but it's not a solution. So, how to change? We've got to be quick to go to Jesus. We've got to be quick to go to the cross. We've got to be quick to point people in that direction. Ephesians chapter 4, again, we were in Ephesians chapter 4 last week in the first few verses to see the importance of community, but he goes on to talk about the change and growth, growth process in Ephesians chapter 4, and he says in verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. See, this passage reminds us that the person of Christ is the goal. It's where we're headed. It's what all of us corporately are striving to. We want to become more like Jesus Christ. But he doesn't stop by just giving us the goal in that text. What he does is he shows us the means to achieve it. Because he goes on to say that we're not going to be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But here it is, speaking the truth in love, we grow up into him in all things. He's the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly compacted, joined together by what everything supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. Right? All of us contribute, but it's God who is effectually working in each of us. God is the means by which we achieve change and growth. You don't change and grow yourself. God, working through His Spirit and His Word, accomplishes or brings about change in our life. He's the goal, and He's the means to accomplish it. And here's the fourth, and that's this. It's fruit. Fruit. All right, so right that it's the fourth element in the change and growth process. We've talked about thorns. We can call that the negative fruit. But then we're, we're talking about spiritual fruit. We're talking about good fruit. This is similar to thorns in that they, they're often responses to the things that we're going through, but they're different than thorns in that fruit is what we do that pleases God. It pleases the Lord. Fruit can be seen in your desire. 
when you, when you are faced with a trial and you want to please God in your marriage, or you want to please God in your parenting, or you want God to be glorified in your witnessing, uh, that's a fruit that God produces in you. He gives you right desires and passions. Fruit can be seen in how we behave. Our responses, like when somebody says a curse word to us, or they're very short with us, uh, and they're, they're getting on to us, how we respond in that moment. Are we going to be like Christ, who when, when he was reviled, didn't revile back? Right? That's good fruit. And man, if you're responding that way, guess what? You're in that change and growth process, becoming more like Jesus. And that's awesome. And God is producing good fruit in you, in your in not just your desires, but in your behavior. And fruit certainly is enjoyed as consequence of right living in our life. It's, it's awesome when, when, by God's grace, we want to do right and we do the right thing, and then there's good things that flow out of that. And God gives, gives a, just victory in, in our lives, and to Him be all the glory. So looking for reconciliation with a brother for God's glory, and our church's corporate witness could be an example of how fruit takes place. There's a, there's a struggle. Um, rather than divide, rather than uh, disengage, we're going to work because of the cross to reconcile and unite. We're going to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. By the, by the grace of God, we're going to work at that. It's not going to be easy, but, but this, is, this is the map. I mean, that, that's what the map says. We're, we're going to go in that direction because that's pleasing to the Lord. It reflects the unity, as we learned last week, the unity of the Trinity when we go after that. And, and it's going to, the consequence of that is the church looks more like Christ. The church looks right when, when we as believers look to reconcile with a brother we had ought with. Faith in God and repentance is a fruit of the, of, of the cross that comes from the cross. When we, when we trust in God, man, that's change because the reality is we previously didn't trust in God. Faith manifests itself in repentance. It turns us around from our old crooked past to follow His way. It's a dis, dis, uh, decisive shift not only in our thoughts and feelings and actions, but also in the overarching trajectory of our life, Matt Chandler said. So, those are the four things. Those are four elements of the change process. Now, there are a number of passages where as you read the Bible, you study the Bible, you're going to see various aspects of these or the emphasis might be on one or more of them to a different degree. There's no one go-to passage where it says, you're going to, you know, you're going to find it where it says, you, know, you, you, see the, you, you see the heat, you see the thorn, you see the cross, you see that. But the, the passage we read in Jeremiah 17, I think, opens it up. So open up to Jeremiah 17. And this would be a great uh, study for your care group or study personally for your own family and your family devotions is to think through when you read a passage, is there anything here that's heat, right, circumstance? Is there anything here that's heart or thorns, like sinful things, in, in that sinful responses, desires, circumstances, and behaviors? Um, it, where's the cross? Where's the hope? Where's the glory? And then certainly, it, what, what's the consequence? What's the good fruit? What's God trying to do? So in Jeremiah 17, you see all these things in this text. And I'm going to read it again. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusts in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart uh, uh, departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like a heath, or a shrub, or a bush in the desert, and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not, not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. Well, looking here in this passage, um, you can mark up your scriptures with the, the, you know, like heat, right? Here's some heat stuff. Like in verse number six, uh, it says, shall inhabit the parched places of the wilderness. I mean, that's a very picturesque discussion of the difficulty of what's going to take place in the life of a person who trusts in themselves and doesn't trust in God. I mean, the, the things, the pressures, the heat just increases. Or in verse number 8, the second part, He shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf 
uh, uh, the, the heat comes. The reality is the heat comes. The pressures come. We see thorns in verse 6 where it talked about the, the word heath um, in, in the King James or shrub in the New King James or, or bush in some translations. The idea is it's just a small little desert plant uh, that is, some would say, even a juniper, a small little bush. Uh, it represents the ungodly man who turns from the Lord. He's not a thriving, growing tree that's described later in the same context. So Jeremiah's calling out, thus says the Lord, this is what it's going to look like. If you don't trust in me, man, uh, that's, that's the direction, that's where you are, that's how you're responding uh, when you say, I'm going to trust in man, I'm not going to trust in God. So it kind of pictures that. We see, we see the picture of the cross or pointing us to the Lord. And the end of verse number 5, whoso heart departs from the Lord. And then in verse number 7, blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. I mean, we look to the Lord. We look, he's our hope. We're going to trust in Him. Um, Israel that Jeremiah was prof, uh, prophesying to, man, they weren't looking to the Lord. And they were going to experience the heat and the drought of the uh, being carried off into the captivity. And, uh, and he says, look, look to the Lord. Israel, trust in the Lord. Find your hope in Him. And we certainly see fruit in verse number 8. The person who trusts in the Lord is as a tree. And again, picturesque of this lush tree that's producing. It's by the water. It has green leaves even in the heat. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and in the year of the drought, it's, it's not concerned because it's getting its nourishment um, from the Lord. It's going to continue to increase. It won't stop yielding fruit. I really like that concept in verse number 8 um, because it, it reminds us, as Curtis made mention to earlier, that that's how we should define a good day. A good day or a good month or a good year is not the absence of heat. A good day, a good month, a good week, a good year is when the heat is there but you're still flourishing and producing good fruit. And, and why are we producing good fruit? Why do we have right desires? Why do we have right behaviors? And why is there good consequences that flow out of that? Why is that happening? Because we placed our trust in who? In the Lord, not in man. So I really like that. Many times you're like, I prayed today. What would you pray for? I prayed for an easy day. I prayed for a problem-free day. I prayed there would be no pressure. I prayed there would be no heat. I think what we're being told here is the process of change may include some heat. It's going to include some heat. We live in a fallen world. As I meditated on this, these realities and these four kind of stages of change, you know why there won't be that necessarily changing and growing in heaven? There's not going to be any heat, right? We don't live in a fallen circumstance in heaven. And we won't deal with our internal sin. There won't be any thorns in that sense in heaven. The only part of the change process that will be in heaven is the cross, right? Who God is and everything he has done. And then the fruit that remains because of the cross and who God is and everything he does. That's heaven! I'm looking forward to heaven, amen? But here's the reality. We're not there yet. We still live, in, we still live with pressure and heat and struggle and trial. And we still have... As this text says, that depraved heart. And we're still struggling against that. And that's why we continually and daily have to run to the cross and see God and understand his work of redemption. Friends, this is the big picture. And it gives us hope. Well, I want to give a, a real-life illustration of this as well. Um, I recently had an opportunity to uh, counsel with a couple. And I want to tell you the story of Tim and Kelly. Uh, they sent me an email just a few months ago to kind of recap as we graduated them. And she sent an email just because uh, I asked her, I said, I want you to put your testimony of what God has done in your life uh, in just a, a one-page testimony. And, uh, and she worked on it, and she sent it. The both of them worked on it together, and they sent it. But it came, it came from Kelly. And I was so encouraged. I read it to my wife. Her and I went on a double date with this couple just to kind of celebrate um, where God is taking them. They're a younger couple. They live in a, uh, almost an hour's drive away. Uh, somebody in their church recommended our counseling ministry, and uh, they contacted us back in December, uh, or uh, earlier even than that. But, uh, and we, we started, started meeting weekly. They would drive. They would drop their kids off, 
at their parents' house and drive here. And, um, and I just want you to hear from them about the change that occurred in their lives and in their marriage. And to God be the glory for all this. Um, as it was my privilege through the counseling process just to help show them the big picture that I just explained to you. There's pressures, there's the heat in life, there's the thorns, the things we bring into our marriage that is disruptive and sinful and how the cross and the work of Christ helps our marriage and helps our communication and helps us respond differently to the pressures and then they're experiencing different fruit. I mean, just, a, just different things are occurring in their marriage because of it. So in her words, she says, she says Tim and I started counseling in December of 2016. Uh, we're, we're not, we were not at the best place in our relationship, but definitely not at our worst. We were experiencing a lot of distrust and bitterness because of previous choices we had made before and during our relationship. We also grew up in very different atmospheres and had very different biblical backgrounds. We started off on the wrong foot, and it only got worse from there. At the point that we came to counseling, we, were, we had buried so many issues that our everyday, numb communication felt normal. We had just decided we wanted to work on the small issues that we had, only to find out that we had buried some, some other issues that needed to be dealt with. During counseling, we learned that our most important goal in our marriage and in our home is to please God. Up to that point, we didn't really have any goals for ourselves or our marriage. Through God's Word, we learned in Proverbs 28, 13, that those who conceal their sin do not prosper, but those that confess and repent find mercy. Neither of us had ever actually experienced repentance, which was a huge reason for our lack of communication and distrust. My husband learned what it meant to put his trust in God and, acceptance, and accept his forgiveness. He was saved a few weeks after beginning counseling. Ephesians 4, 22-24 says that you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted um, by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind and to put on your new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. From this, we learned how to have a different heart that pleased the Lord. You must put off your old self, renew your mind, and put on your new self. <clears throat> Dealing with our past was a big part of putting off our old selves. We now know through Romans 8, 28, that God works for good of those who love Him, even though we had not so great past, God could use us for His good. After a few months of counseling, I somewhat had the unrealistic expectation that our marriage was now going to be perfect. One of God's truths is that He doesn't expect us to be perfect, but He does expect us to be growing and changing to be more like Christ. It's a process, she wrote. We need to be in God's Word every day. Right? You've got to come to the cross. Right? But uh, what, uh, what you study today is not enough to sustain you for tomorrow. After learning to study the Bible every day and to put our focus in God always, even during a trial, we know that we can get through anything with God's help. What's Tim and Kelly saying? Now, the heat's still there. Their past is still their past. The pressures are still their pressures, and they still have sinful desires within their own heart. But they learned a little bit more about who God is and His plan to redeem them personally and in their marriage. And they continually review that. They continually come to the cross and there's different fruit. The heat's still there. The pressures are still there. He's still a guy. She's still a gal. And, and, and they don't always communicate. But, but change is taking place in their life. I wanted to share that story with you, certainly so that we can rejoice in what God does in, in and through His Word. But I also wanted to share that story with you in this sermon this morning as we're talking about the big picture on how people change so that those of you who are sitting here going, yeah, I still want the turn by turn. I, I still want that book in the Bible that tells me what to do next. I want you to hear that when you understand the big picture, it begins to make sense of where you're at right now and what you should do. So, what do we do when we get the big picture? How does this help? <clears throat> well, since we're always reacting to the things that are taking place all around us, the Bible helps us make sense of the world that we live in. Your Bible helps you with that. The pressure men face in Scripture, according to 1 Corinthians 10, 13, is a common thing. We all face common pressures. 
It's common in the scriptures, and it's common in our world. And so the Word is our guide. It's not about, it's not about man's answers. It's not about psychology. It, it, change and growth, um, it, is, it, it comes from, from, from following and pursuing Christ. We're not looking for the world's answers. We look to the Word. Getting the big picture provides an honest and an insightful and even a humbling view of our human condition. When we look in the Word of God, when we see that even the man after God's own heart, David, sinned in a wicked, vile way, and we read here in Jeremiah 17 that the heart is desperately wicked, I mean, it, it humbles us. It, it causes us to think, I can't make myself holy. I need the cross. We run to the cross when we get a picture of our own condition. And our solutions don't come from man saving himself. It doesn't come from us changing our environment or escaping the pressure or the heat, changing the work or getting rid of the teenager. You know, that's not the solution. Getting the big picture offers us hope because we begin to look at the world from a God-centered perspective, from that helicopter view. And we're reminded that though we are lost sometimes and not sure what to do, the Lord is with us. As the psalmist wrote, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, a very present help in the heat, a very present help when the thorns are just growing all around. God is with us. Matthew starts his gospel by reminding us that his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. What hope the Bible offers when it shows us a God who is with us in the trial. So getting the big picture reminds us that God is with us no matter what we're going through. And then finally, it encourages us that good fruit can result when we respond in faith. I mean, there, things can be different in your marriage. Things can be different in your life. You can have hope. You can be encouraged when you pursue the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. You can respond differently when your husband forgets the things that you ask him to do. You can trust when the storm clouds are gathering. You can endure in the trial. You can pray without ceasing even though you're discouraged. You can honor your parents even when they're flawed. You can die in faith. Now, what a great fruit that is. Somebody who, because of their trust in God, is able to die with dignity and faith and not renounce God, but trust in God. What a beautiful fruit. All that fruit comes only by the way of the cross. So if you're here personally and you're thinking, well, what do I do? I just, I've been presented with this big picture. There's the heat that goes on. There's the thorns that come out. There's the cross I need to intersect with. And, and there's fruit that God can produce. What do I do with that? Well, personally, I just would encourage you to ask good questions. Right? Ask questions like, what's going on in my life right now? That's the situation. What's going on? Ask this question. How am I responding to it? Am I, you know, are the thorns appearing? What, what do I want to have happen? Do I want God to be pleased or do I want to escape? Um, you can ask yourself, well, what does the Bible say about this? What does the Bible say concerning my response? What does the Bible say about the pressure? What does the Bible say about who God is and his presence with me? What does the Bible say? And then how can we pray about it? God, Here's, here's what you desire. Here's the fruit you want to produce. God, help me to do that. Because of Christ and his offer of life, help that, help that to be different in my life. So personally, we can take this big picture and begin to apply it even this week in our own time with the Lord, looking at our own life and the circumstance which we live in. But then I think relationally, how we respond to other people. We can take this big picture as we're listening to people's story and we begin to, to have confidence no matter what the pressure is and no matter what the responses are. <clears throat> Everyone that you interact with, no matter what their story, you can give them hope because the hope is found in Christ. And if you know the big picture, you can turn to just about anywhere in the Word of God and you can show them hope because our hope is found in God's character and His actions. So I want to encourage you, in the hallway, in just a few moments, if somebody starts to talk about the struggle that they're going through, find a way to point them to the cross. Find a way to give them hope in God. 
When you're in care group this week, don't just come in and talk about how miserable life is. Talk about the existence of the reality of struggles in life. But friends, let's each one of us in our care group say, we're going to bring up the victory we have in Christ. Amen. We're going to center on our hope. We're going to go to the cross. So in our relationships with other people, let's be encouraged. We have hope to offer. So, friends, that's the big picture. That's the helicopter view. You might, be, you, might, you might have come in today and you're, you're lost. You're struggling and, and you, didn't know, you know where you want to go, but you don't know how to get there. Now, hopefully today we kind of looked at the helicopter view and you've got a better understanding. So what do I do? I, I'm not going to tell you exactly what you should do, but it's going to involve two things. Number one, you've got to admit. You've got to admit that you're part of the problem. That somewhere along the storms of life, the pressure and the heat that you're facing, that you're maybe not responding the way that there's some thorns there, there's something coming out from, from within. And, and change and growth always begins with us saying, oh, wretched man that I am, Romans 7, 24. Right? There's, there's things in here that need to change. They're not quite like Christ yet. So if you want to change, you need to identify what needs to change. It's not out there. It's in here. So we have to admit, I'm part of the problem. Are you willing to say that this morning? Number two, you have to turn. Because oftentimes, we're trying to deal with the pressures of life and the heat and the struggles in our own effort. And the cross is where the solution is. Our care group got launched on Friday already. We are talking about the struggles that most guys face. And one of the guys said, hey, I don't know if other guys face this, but I face this. It's a struggle. Is that I try to solve everything myself, right? The heat and the pressure of life, and I'm, I'm just going to muster up the strength to do it. And, and man, and he knows it. We all know it. We, we've got we've to go to the cross. So we admit and, and we turn. And maybe you're here this morning and you're ready to admit, you know what? I am kind of struggling in my direction and pursuit of holiness. And I need to turn to the Lord for help. And I need to know the Lord better as my example so I can begin to have different fruit in my life. Let's bow together in prayer.